All right, so as Simon mentioned, I was here last year um, talking about sort of the journey that I'd been on trying to get to, to be a trader. Uh, and today I'm going to sort of just focus a little bit more on um, possibly your next step in terms of the, the trading that you want to do. So I've got a Bruce Lee quote um, that says, absorb what is useful, discard what is not, and add what is uniquely your own, which is essentially what you need to do with this this evening. If it holds value to you, or if it's useful to you, take it in. Uh, if you think it's useless, obviously discard it. Uh, and then at the end of the day, uh, trading is very a very personal thing. So you have to add your own sort of flavor to it and you have to find your own way of doing things. So the first step in trading, I guess, is persistence, right? So if you were here last year or you watched this last year um, and you've been pursuing this journey to becoming a trader and you're still at it, then well done. You know, that is the first step. You've made, you've made it past the first milestone. 90% of people who start trading, or majority of people who start trading, are said to lose all their money and fail, um, which is probably true. But the 10% of people that do make it lose all their money, lose more money, try again, try again, try again, try again, persist, 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 and then eventually they get to a point where they can sustainably make money in the market. Not all times are good, though, you know, sometimes are bad, uh, sometimes are good. Last month was a very bad month for me. Uh, this month is off to a cracking start, so I'm very, very pleased with that. Um, one thing is for certain, as you carry on trading, it gets more interesting. You learn more stuff, you learn how things are interrelated. Uh, it's a never-ending sort of journey of continuous learning. So learning is the focus uh, primarily, so something that I try to do is, you know, learn something new every day or learn something new every week. Uh, just so that you can continuously improve upon yourself. Um, so last time I was here, as I said, I mentioned, uh, I was, spoke about the things I've been through to get to, to the point where I can trade uh, for a living. Uh, quite a few things have changed since last year. Um, I've sort of gone on my own. I've started my own broking firm. Uh, so I'm trading in my pajamas for the most part, which is fantastic. Um, so there's, you know, this, this, the journey is still long. There are many years ahead of me, many lessons still to learn. Um, and so, yeah, the, the focus is really just self-education. So uh, nothing that I can say tonight or nothing that anyone else can teach you is going to make you a profitable trader. There is no course or degree or anything that you can, you can go out and uh, study that's going to teach you how to do this. Yes, you can learn the theory. Behind it, you can learn the techniques. You can learn technical analysis, fundamental analysis. Um, but the actual application of that and making money in the market is something that only you can teach yourself. So the focus has to be um, self-education. So where do you start? Um, with a fancy pair of spectacles. <laughs> uh, right, so there's a couple of basics uh, where you can start. I've mentioned the Just One Lap uh, website. They've basically been doing something called the IG Bootcamp series. Uh, as well as they're currently busy with a masterclass series. These are a series of videos that are about an hour long each, uh, and there are 12 videos in a series. So it is 12 hours of video per series. So that is actually a fantastic place to start. There are people out there that will charge you 20,000 Rand for a trading course where you sit and study for two days, um, essentially 12 hours worth of material, and all of it is for free on YouTube on the Just One Lab channel. So. I don't know, people who sell these courses are probably a little upset, but it really is worth watching those. Uh, it gives you a very, very, very good grounding of um, the basics of fundamental and technical analysis, understanding trends and moving averages and indicators and that kind of stuff. It really is worth watching. Um, I mentioned the process of Googling what you don't understand. This is probably where I learned the most. You know, you come across something that somebody talks about or you see something on TV or you hear traders talking about something and you don't know what it is, so you Google it. You have to do that process and learn by yourself. You know, no one else is gonna, is gonna teach you how to, to do that. You know, a lot of the stuff, most of the stuff, if not all of the stuff, is available on the internet somewhere for free. So paying for, for courses and stuff can be very helpful. There are some courses that are, that are really good. Um, but for the most part, the stuff is essentially available for free. So one of the best um, resources that I've found is a website called investopedia.com. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it, uh, but it is amazing. It has got almost anything that you can think of in terms of uh, uh, the concepts and the, even the things I'm going to be talking about tonight. The stuff that you don't understand, 
go there, search the website. It has a ton of information. They've recently started doing little videos as well. So it'll be you know, two or three pages worth of reading material and then a two minute video to explain it all in, a, uh, in, in one thing. And again, it is completely free. So what you essentially do is what you don't understand, you search for, you go to investopedia.com uh, or to Google and you, you search for it. Throw me off a little bit. Um, <laughs> another great place um, that you can learn is basically on, on different blogs. So um, there are three blogs that I want to highlight today. One is the blog that I write for Just One Lap, which is the Trader Petri blog. Uh, this is basically just a memoir of me, you know, I don't know, rambling on about stuff that I go through and things that happen in the market. Uh, there is also a website called tradingwisdoms.com. This is run and owned by a guy uh, in South Africa. He's, uh, he's quite a cool guy, actually. Um, what he does is he gathers quotes from books uh, which is a great place to go look at a list of books that you want to get, authors, traders, um, that have different quotations on things that they go through in the market, things that they look for. Uh, this focuses a lot on the, the sort of psychological part of trading. So if you feel you need a little bit of motivation, that's a great place uh, to, to go and look. It's also just a nice blog to follow because they update very regularly, maybe once or twice a day, uh, that you can have a look at. This, the content that they put out is very, very helpful. And there's also uh, a website called Peter L, uh, I can't remember. Peter L. Brunt. Peter L. Brunt. Okay, well, it'll be up in a second. Um, this guy's also, he's written a couple of books. He's a very successful trader. Uh, he also focuses a lot on the psychology of trading, uh, as well as some of the sort of the macro uh, economic things or the macro factors that influence it and, and technical things and so on, uh, which, is, which is fairly helpful. Um, and then I've, um, I've highlighted two YouTube channels, which I think are fantastic also. Um, one is called Learn Liberty, and the other one is called Bionic Turtle. So Learn Liberty, uh, basically, obviously they put out videos. Again, everything is free. Uh, and they will teach you anything from macroeconomics to microeconomics to, um, you know, looking at how does central reserve or, or you know, reserve banking work, how does the electoral process in the United States work, all these types of things that could influence the market uh, you can learn from there and it's also a bunch of videos and they've got a bunch of different categories that you can go look at um, to learn you know content on different topics. Uh, Bionic Turtle is more of a mathematical based thing so they will teach you how to you know calculate correlation, they will teach you how to calculate drawdown, they will teach you how to um, do all the really intense mathematical stuff and they give you practical examples of how to do it in Excel um, and it's you know, on YouTube, which is also fantastic. So Bionic, Bionic Turtle and Learn Liberty, I would really suggest that you go and have a look at those. Uh, then trading books. There's a lot of books. Off the top of my head, I can think of uh, Being Right or Making Money. It's a great book. Uh, the New Trading for a Living, The Complete Turtle Trader, um, the Memoirs of a Stock Operator, and uh, what's the other one that I like? Um, Trading in the zone, yes. <laughs> um, it's probably the best one, actually. So there's a, there's a much longer list. I'm going to put that on, on the blog on my website uh, tomorrow, more, most likely, um, of a list of books that I would recommend. These are really just focused not so much on trading technique, but more trading psychology um, and talking about you know, people's journeys as they learn the mistakes that they've made and what they've learned from that and the methodologies that they use to control themselves when, when trading. Uh, a book like, for example, um, Being Right or Making Money is very much a, a statistical approach on backtesting and building systems for trading and uh, building compound indicators that look at very, very many different, um, you know, like different inputs to try and see where the market is. So that was going to not show you how to build a market timing indicator for yourself, but it's going to show you the concept that you need to apply to do that, which is a very, very good book. So when you're on this journey, what do you look for? Right? You look for things you don't understand, essentially. You look for things that are going to be helpful to you. You look for things that you're going to be able to apply. You look for things that, uh, you know, that are going to be practical. So essentially, it's just Googling what you don't know. Um, also, you know, I'm not going to go into it, but things like chart patterns, indicators, Fibonacci retracements, moving averages, um, trend lines, all of this type of stuff is very important for you to, to learn. It's not the make all and end all of trading, 
but it does help a lot when it comes to doing technical analysis. And again, this is all stuff that is covered in those IG bootcamp videos and the IG masterclass videos. So the basics of that is there. Again, if you then you know, can't remember what a megaphone pattern is, go to Google, click images, type megaphone pattern, and it's there. <laughs> and it's got tons of examples. Um, and also, if you find a new system or you've read a bunch of things that you think are going to help you uh, put a trading strategy together, learn Liberty or, or Bionic Turtle, learn how to build models in Excel, build them in Excel, backtest them, make sure that they work uh, before you start trading them with real money. What to avoid, <laughs> right? The internet is filled with ads that uh, promise you money. I mean, there's one that says, this guy, this is a little video, I made 482,000 pounds, and that's just in my first month. I've got no experience. Oh, it's amazing. This system is fantastic. Just give us your credit card details, and we'll teach you. It is not a polite word. It is really trying to, I mean, don't, don't even try and avoid these. Avoid these at all costs. Any website that you go to, because, you know, they track you. They see you're Googling trading stuff, and they start serving you with all these ads that try and, you know, f fool you out of your money. So... I think by now these should be fairly easy to recognize, so just avoid them at all costs. People who try to say to you, you know, <clears throat> I landed in my helicopter because I'm such a good trader. Um, you know, I got a room with a thousand people in it. If each of you give me 20 grand, I'm going to teach you how to make be millionaires in like three weeks. And then I'm going to fly off in my helicopter because I'm such a good trader. No, he's not a good trader. He's taking your money. That's how he's paying for his helicopter. <laughs> you know, so... Um, so avoid, avoid that stuff. Um, so the, uh, different trading styles. Okay, so there are, I'm going to focus on three. I see it almost as a pyramid. Okay, so you start off at the, at the bottom of the pyramid, which is the longer term stuff, which is more really investing compared to trading or long term trading. Uh, and then you move one step up into the medium term sort of stuff, small swing trading, that kind of thing. And then the very pinnacle is day trading. So everybody that asks me stuff. I want to be a day trader. So since last year, I've had quite a few queries, people going, I want to be a day trader, you know, where can I start? So just to clarify exactly what day trading is, because I feel that a lot of people don't really understand what it is. And if they did, they would probably see that it's not suited to 90% or 99% of people out there. Day trading is essentially exactly what it says, all right? It is trading intraday. So you buy and sell stock within the same day. You don't carry stock overnight. The reason for this, well, there's, a, there's a bunch of reasons, but usually people who are day traders work within trading firms. Okay, so a member firm, a member of the JSC. This means that they have direct access into the market. So they need to carry a qualification that allows them to be their own stockbroker. So there's no stockbroker between them and the market. They're trading directly on it as their own stockbroker. So this gives them the advantage of a couple of things. One, their trading fee is very low. So, you know, I pay 20 basis points a trade that I make because I have to go through a prime broker in order to do so. The guy who's sitting in the prime broker trading is trading directly on the JSC. If he buys 1,000 Anglos or 1,000 Nusbers, I mean, what's 20 basis points of 1,000 Nusbers? It is a big trade. He could do it for 30 bucks if there's a big enough offer. So their trading cost is so incredibly low that very, very small movements in the market can make them profit. So this is, you know, one of the things. So now what, what happens here is because they have such low costs and they have access to exponential type gearing that they oftentimes can't afford to settle a thousand Nusbash um, at the end of the day because you're going to have to cough up quite a bit of money, you know, 20 million bucks um, by the end of the day. Or you're going to need the margin to either book it over into a derivative like a CFD or a single stock future. Or you're going to have to put the full value of that trade on the table in cash to settle it in, in equity. So the trades don't settle. So they buy it and sell it, they start with cash, they end with cash, that way they don't have to settle the trades, they can keep the difference. They provide liquidity to the market. They stand in between people like us and you know the hedge fund and the mom and pop trader at home who wants to buy and sell at different levels and they're just basically buying from the one and selling to the other and making sure that at the end of the day, they've got no, um, no positions left. So this is really for the tip of the pyramid, right? These are the guys you need to have the strongest discipline because this is where you fall into the pitfalls of, uh, of over-trading and, and 
you know, trading out of fear and greed and not quantifying your risk before you get into the trades. I mean, this is, I was in a day trading firm in the, in the early stages of my trading career, if you want to call it that, and I learned the hard way. I spoke about that last year, um, that it is, you know, day trading is really not for everyone. So, um, you know, very often times these guys trade very fast time frames. So they'll have a look at daily and weekly charts, but throughout the course of the day, they're oftentimes not even looking at the charts. They're looking at the bids and offers moving. So they remember the levels and they're trading off those levels. So it is really for guys who have the resources and the time to do this full time for a living, go sit in a day trading firm and not need any other source of income. Obviously they trade with money that they can afford to lose, you know, so they're very well capitalized. Um, and it's not investors, okay? So this is not for someone who's looking to make long-term gains. This is looking for someone who's looking to make, you know, a certain percentage or a certain amount of money every month. So they're not working on percentage return. They're working on, I made 10 grand today. I lost four grand today, that kind of thing, okay? So it's really um, the tip of the pyramid. So, you know, talking about different strategies that they can, that they can uh, apply is very difficult because it's, it's very reactionary based. Um, a news item would come out or a sense article, whatever, something would happen and the stock would move. And then it's fastest fingers first. There's only so many shares on the bird or so many shares in offer. You know, sometimes you'd hear half the room shouting, yeah, because they're all long something and it's making money and the other half the room like crying because they missed it because the price has just moved too fast. Um, so, you know, these, these are all lessons that I sort of learned the, the hard way. And I think it's important that people who are starting out or are, uh, have been at this for even a couple of years, you know, do it slower. Do it in the, in the, in the slower term, the longer term, or in the medium term, because this is really um, very, very difficult. And don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to discourage you from, from becoming a day trader if that is your goal, but don't quit your job and go join a day trading firm because you've got to pay a rental to be there firstly, and you, you know, if your story is anything like mine, five months down the line, you're going to wish you had all your capital <laughs> still, you know? Um, and there's longer term trading. So this is the base of the pyramid. Um, so this is more sort of trend trading or investing or whatever the case is. You take a more fundamental approach on stocks. Um, your immediate return is not necessarily the goal. You're looking for, for dividend income or, or, you know, overall growth over a number of years. Um, and here, trade identification or opportunity identification is relatively important. So there's a couple of fundamental things that you can use to identify them. Again, uh, I encourage you to go out and Google, you know. Uh, but some of the things that I look for, for example, is stuff that is undervalued. Um, the companies that are very dominant in their space or have very low uh, levels of competition in an industry with high barriers of entry. Um, you know, companies that have low PEs, high dividend yields. PE is not as important as dividend yield or dividend growth, uh, for example. Um, headline earnings per share growth. So you're looking for companies that have a proven track record of earning more and more and more money every half or every year. Um, return on equity. So really just the fundamental analysis, buying good quality companies, right? Something else that I, that I look out for is analyst upgrades. So if JP Morgan upgrades a stock, and then next week, Credit Suisse, and next week, the next one, and the next one, and the next one. Then you've got a whole bunch of analysts starting to upgrade stocks, which means that the big funds are starting to buy, which could create a bit of buying pressure, or same with downgrades. So analyst re-ratings on stocks is something that you could look out for, as well as long-term trend changes um, and fundamental sort of changes in the company. So I've got an example, and disclaimer, I'm cherry-picking all the examples, <laughs> all the good ones, the ones that really worked well. Um, so this is Telcom. We're starting in about 2014, um, well, 2013 really, where Telcom starts restructuring its business, talking about letting go of half their staff, um, really sort of s slimlining their business so there's fundamental change starting to happen. So this is a bit of a longer term trading strategy. So Telcom now is identified as a potential long term investment. Um, so we start looking at technicals. So on this particular chart, what I've got here is I've got three moving averages. I've got an 89-week moving average. This is a weekly chart. I've got a 20 and a 10 moving average. So basically what happens is there's a robust entry, and then you add your position in the buying zone, and you stop out when you reach your stop. So to explain the robust entry, the robust entry is basically when price on a weekly basis moves up through the bottom of the 89-day moving average. 
When that happens, at the end of that week, that following Monday, you can buy the stock. So that is your long-term buying signal, as indicated there. Oh. So that is your, uh, your first entry price, 2178 or 2179, whatever, and your stop loss is then at the previous low, slightly below the previous low. Okay? If you're using a 2% strategy uh, or 2% risk management rule, this works quite well. So you're risking only 2% of your capital if you get it wrong. Here, the stock's got to fall like 50% for you to lose 2%, so it's a very small position. What happens now is the stock price moves up into that area between the 10 and the 20 moving average on the weekly chart, which we're calling the buying zone. So you're going to have a bid halfway in the middle of that, uh, or in the midpoint between those two moving averages. You're going to have a bid for another, um, for another position. And you're going to put your stop loss at the previous low. In this case, it's very close to where your entry price was. You could even leave it there for now if you wanted to, but in this case, it was moved up to there. So there you take your next position, again with a 2% rule. And you rinse and repeat this every single time it enters into that buying zone. So every time it comes into the buying zone, you add a position, you move your stop loss up. You add a position, you move your stop loss up. Add a position, move your stop loss up. Eventually, it's going to stop you out. All right, so you've now added to this position eight times, every time on a 2% rule. Six of your eight positions have stopped out in the money. One, obviously, you entered there, you've lost 2%. Position number seven, you might take a small loss on or you might break even on, but you've got six trades that you've made a lot of money on. So that's a nice long-term trading strategy. This is a two-year trade. You know, so that took a long time for this trade to, to work out. And if you look now, uh, very recently, here we have another robust entry. 89-day moving average, it got you in there. The stop loss is there. Boom. Okay, so moving on. Um, then there's swing trading, which is almost like the halfway between day trading and longer term trading. So this is where I think most of you guys fit in. This is where I fit in um, for the most part. Um, this is like the middle of the pyramid, okay? So what you're wanting to do here is you're wanting to identify the long-term trends, the long-term trades. So you look for trades like this, and then you try and trade with the trend, right? So you look for the long-term trend, the weekly, the daily trends, and you trade in favor of that trend or with that trend at all times. Um, trades last between two hours and two weeks, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter. Uh, and you're trading on technical principles, but within a fundamental universe. So you've gone and you've made a list of stocks that meet your criteria for long-term investment based on your fundamental analysis. And in these trades, you're looking for long only, for example, or you can look for short only if you've picked a bunch of companies that you think are going to zero. Um, and you trade with the, with the primary trend, right? I'm saying here that it's better to not watch the trade every, every, second, of the, every second of the day because odds are it'll drive you crazy. Um, Stop loss rules are very clear, need to be very clear. You need to stick to them. I slip up on that some, from time to time. Sometimes it works out in my favor, most times it doesn't. <laughs> and you know, oftentimes you could wait for two or three weeks because there's just no setups and there's nothing happening, especially if you're trading daily time frames, which are often the bigger, the bigger moves. So the goal, as I said, is to identify the longer term overall trend and trade with that trend. Um, and here, your things like your Fibonacci retracements, your chart patterns, uh, support and resistance level, trend lines, moving averages, that type of stuff comes in handy. So to give you an example of a strategy, um, this is one of the strategies that I use uh, for some of the trading that I do. So this is a long only strategy, I'm calling it wave trading. Um, it's got elements of a couple of different things in it. So there are some Elliott Wave elements in there, ElliottWave.com if you want to learn about it. Simon will think you're crazy. Um, I don't know if I believe Elliott Wave. I do like the ABC patterns, though. They work quite well. So, um, so the rules are 25% exposure. I'll cover that in a couple of minutes. And we're basically swing trading on the ABC principle. So the ABC principle says that the market moves in waves. Uh, I'll show you on a chart in a moment. And universe shares only, which means it's shares that meet your fundamental criteria for longer term investment so that you can go long only. And because you're on a 25% stop loss or 25% exposure rule, you might not necessarily have to take your stop because you've got a long-term growth company or whatever the case is. So if you get your timing wrong, it's not the end of the world. Okay. Um, entry criteria. It needs a kiss of a moving average, stochastic move up through 50 or 20. Um, I preempt stochastic a lot of the time. 
um, which sometimes bites me, sometimes doesn't. Uh, but 350 is the safest way and a break of resistance. So uh, I'll show an example in a moment. Uh, exit criteria, uh, either you've reached your stop loss or you've reached your pattern target or there's a fundamental change in the business. I don't know, a telephone company gets fined a trillion euro or something like that. That might get you out the trade. Um, or a clear trend reversal. Then stop loss is slightly below the B, um, slightly below the B point on the, on the wave trade, so I'll show you where that is. And then uh, you can use a 9-12 exponential moving average as a trailing stop loss, or if the trend starts moving in your favor, you can draw a little trend line in, if it breaks that trend line, you can then get out. Um, then there are a couple of must-haves for, for your entry criteria, so uh, you have to have these things, they must be present. Uh, maybe not all of them, but most of them. So, a validated wave pattern, multiple time frame trends. So you wanting, if you're wanting to trade a one hour trade, for example, is the daily trend up? You're trading long on a one hour, are you trading long on the daily as well? Are you trading long on the weekly as well? So you'd ideally like all three time frames to point in the same direction, long term, short term, medium term, right? Um, same with shorts. Uh, then you need a confirmed trend. So moving averages need to be below price. Um, you know, obviously the longer term ones, the shorter term ones might be above, the 10 and 20, but the 50 and the 89 and the 100 need to be below price. Stochastic needs to be coming from an oversold position moving up uh, in the case of going long and the opposite in the case of going short. Primary trend needs to be up, fan lines I'm not really going to go into, and you are only trading the B to C move. So you can measure from zero to A, you can measure the, the target. I'm scratching this thing, sorry. Um, and of course, high probability setups, which is good risk reward, which means any trade with a, with a risk reward ratio of higher than one to two or one to three is ideal, one to four is even better, uh, but one to two is the minimum. So if you're risking one rand and you're not looking to make at least two rand, don't take the trade. Uh, and relative outperformance of the top 40, so this is part of my universe. Um, it needs to match a number of, of uh, earnings growth criteria, and it needs to be relatively outperforming the top, the top 40. Then there's a couple of nice to haves and a couple of things to watch out for. So the things you watch out for are stuff that can get you out the trade. So bearish candle formations or bullish candle formations if you're short. Um, you know, distribution patterns, falling volume in the, in, the, in the direction of your trend. So if the trending up and the volume's coming down, uh, a break of the 50 period moving average. Um, you know, there's a, there's a bunch of them. You can, you can have a look at those. Also the nice to haves, there are like bullish candle formations, bullish divergence. I like bullish divergence quite a bit. Uh, a 38.2% retracement on, uh, on the Fibonacci or slightly deeper. No deeper than 61.8 though. That's all stuff that you'll learn on investopedia.com. So <laughs> go there. Um, and then, you know, rising volume, bullish stochastics, that kind of stuff is all the nice to have. So here's a, a couple of examples. Again, cherry picking. Uh, this is Kumba. Um, so just to explain this ABC principle to you. If you look over there, you could call that point A, and then you've got that move up, oh sorry, point zero, move up to A, down to B, up to C. So you could measure that and project it up. And here you've got zero to A, down to B, up to C. Zero to A, down to B, up to C. Right, so it's moving in those sort of sahtana, you know, like a saw. Um, so there's a couple of things that happened here. It interacted with uh, with uh, uh, longer term moving average, which is 100 term 100 period moving average here. So your entry was under slightly under 120. Uh, that was the upper limit of the of the entry. So anything underneath that would have been great. So there's it's 119. Stop loss below B. So we've got zero here. A there. This is B. Um, and then your stop loss is slightly below B, right? So what you're looking for here is a break of this resistance line. Stochastic that needs to move up. So I preempted this, to be honest with you. As you can see, the stochastic only just started turning, but I'm being a bit more sensitive on the stochastic because the, there's a bit of a buy signal there. The moving average is crossing over the signal line, or the signal line is moving over the stochastic line. It's uh, whatever. So, um, and then you can put a target to it. This was quite a conservative target. And then, as you can see, that one worked out. This chart was done today. It went even higher. <laughs> you know? So I was a bit conservative there, but that's a good sort of example. Here's another one on oil. You've got a zero A going up for C. You've got a target, a break of resistance. It's interacted with its moving averages. Uh, stochastic is up through 50 nicely here, and bang, it plays out. 
All right, so that is one sort of way. This is an open trade that I have at the moment. Um, sort of a similar setup here. Zero A coming down for B. It's got a support level. Stochastics are starting to play along. The thing is starting to turn. So it's starting to match many of my criteria. You can draw a little resistance line in there and you've got a, a long trigger. So you've got three things telling you that you want to be long and then you can target those highs. That's probably a bit conservative. This actually targets a bit higher. Um, but I could be really biased on oil as well. So I don't know. So managing emotions is the next step. So I think the message I'm trying to get through here with the previous bunch of slides is you need to have a strategy. Okay, you need to sit down and think about how you're going to do things. Um, it's like starting a business or uh, you know, anything else really. You need to have a plan. You know? uh, without a plan, you're, you're kind of just throwing darts in the dark. So managing emotion uh, is a relatively important concept because I think that emotions are probably the biggest stumbling block for, for traders. And there's no way that you can get rid of emotions. So don't think that to be a successful trader, you need to be the stone cold um, sort of trader that has no feelings and you know, just is always keeps his cool. Because um, that's not the case. But you need to be self-aware. So there's two different types of definitions of self-awareness. The one is that you are aware of the impact that you have on the people and the environment around you, your actions, uh, for example, in the market very often your, react, your input to the market is very small, so the market is bigger than us all. So your impact on the world around you, the environment is very small. So uh, in the trading perspective, I suppose, self-awareness is more of understanding the emotional state that you're in, what got you into that emotional state, and how that emotional state influences the decisions that you make. Because your objective is to think rationally, because if you're in a trade, uh, for example, and it's going against you and it gets to a stop loss point, you've got to be able to say, I need to walk away from this thing. And if you start thinking irrationally because you're feeling emotional about the money that you're losing, you might not make a decision that is in your own best interest. So emotional control or emotional management is really just about staying objective and acting in your own best interest. Right? So I know, for, for example, with my, my biggest problem is that if, I, if I'm on a losing streak, it's fine. I can keep going. I'll dig my way out of it, and I'll start doing well. If I've gone on a hot streak, and I've made a ton of money over a period of two, three months, then my brain chemistry changes a little bit, and I get overconfident, and I stop listening to stop losses, and I start trading too big, and then you know, the house of cards falls down, and i got to like, okay, recover, and then get my way out of it again. So that happens a lot. So um, this is something I think that, that is very important. So this is something that I put on the Just One Lap blog. Uh, I'm not sure when, last year, maybe earlier this year. The four A's of emotional management or emotional control. Okay, so they are acknowledge, anticipate, accept, and act. So acknowledge how you feel. Right? I feel elated because I've had the biggest trading day of the year yesterday. And I feel like I can walk on water because I caught the long from the lows all the way into the close of the US session last night. Okay, I missed the rally today. Fine. <laughs> but I feel great. Okay, so acknowledge that and think, okay, what can this do? Anticipate what this feeling of feeling great can do to my decision-making process. When I feel this way, I tend to trade riskier. I tend to take bigger trades. I tend to ignore stop losses. I tend to feel overconfident. So anticipate what, how you feel is going to... to uh, how that's going to impact your decision making. And also, anticipate how you're going to feel if some things go wrong or if things go right. I'm in a series of trades. Uh, if I get all of them wrong, I'm going to feel really crappy. So, you know, anticipate that feeling so that when that feeling happens, if that feeling happens, you're, it doesn't take you by surprise. You're almost ready for it, you know? And then accept whatever outcome it is that you've had. If you've had a couple of losing trades and you can acknowledge that you're feeling really angry and really upset or whatever about um, the results that you've gotten, you have to accept them at some point and say like, you know what, this is it, I can't change it, you can't unscramble the egg, um, I need to sort of just accept it and I need to move on. Or you can say like, I accept that I have, I'm feeling overconfident because I've been doing really well um, and then that allows you to act rationally because now you've understand, you've learned to understand your emotion, where it comes from and how it influences the way that you think and the way that you make decisions and then you can get to a point where you can act rationally. So this is, I think, uh, this is most of trading, really, to be honest with you. I mean, the technical stuff, 
you can learn it all on the internet. Um, but this is a, is, is a very important piece of the puzzle. So getting rid of negativity, this is something that, uh, that helps um, because it does happen. You do get smashed by the market every now and then and you feel, you know, why am I doing this? Um, so a couple of things. You need to get some exercise every now and then. So walk around. This, I mean, I've started trading from home and <laughs> I found that you know, I'm leaving the house hardly ever. So I have to now force myself to go out and go take a swim or go to the gym or go for a jog or whatever the case is, just to get fresh air and get see people and do stuff. Otherwise, you know, you go a bit crazy. So you need to go out, you, go, you need to let go of stuff. Um, you need to let go of the market every now and then. So if you've been losing streak, it does help a couple of people to kind of just not trade for a while. Um, I find that if I've been on a losing streak, it's better for me to keep trading, but if I've been on a, on a winning streak, I need to step away. <laughs> you know, so if I've had two or three weeks, I actually wrote a blog post about it not so long ago saying, oh, I've been doing really well, I need to step away, and then I saw a trade that was just too tempting and that ruined me. So um, getting out and, and letting go of the market is, I think, more important when you've been doing well than when, because the market's gonna be there tomorrow, you know? Um, it's not going anywhere. Uh, and then remember things that you're grateful for. I mean, it's corny, but uh, it's true, you know? So if you feel really down, you can start making a list. Hey, I can walk. I've got a family. I've got people who care about me. Um, I've got a roof over my head. That kind of stuff. It's cheesy, but it works. It helps you stay grounded, you know? Uh, keeping your eyes on the prize. So remembering why you're doing this. What's your motivation? What's your goal? Where are you going? What's the vision? Why are you putting yourself through this immense emotional sort of torture? Well, not really torture, but I mean, it is an emotionally charged thing. And this is really a very, very difficult thing to master. So why are you doing this? Uh, resilience is a very intrinsic thing, but it can be taught, you know, it can be practiced, it can be uh, reinforced within yourself by just remembering what the longer term goal is for yourself and for your trading and why you're doing this. I know my personal goal is I don't want to work, <laughs> you know, I want to get to a point where I can ride horses and do cool stuff all day and maybe work for two, three hours and trade from anywhere. That's the goal. I'm very far away from that, but that's my motivation. That's what I'm going for. So remembering that keeps you motivated in the, in the hard times. So managing risk. Uh, there are two main um, lines of thought with managing risk. Well, I don't know if there are two main ones, but uh, there's the 2% rule and there's, there's the exposure rule. So the exposure rule, I don't know. People look at me like I'm crazy when I talk about it. But the 2% rule basically states, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with this, um, which is never risk more than 2% of your total capital in any given trade. So your stop loss level um, determines the size, have I pulled this thing out? No, okay. Uh, your stop loss level determines the size of, of your trade. Okay, so in the case where the stop is below B, you would measure the distance between your entry and your stop, which is the amount of Rand value risk you're taking in the share price movement. Uh, you work out what that is versus 2% of your total capital and your position size is done accordingly. So if the price is 100, your stop loss is at 95, which is 5% down, you're risking five rand a trade or five rand share price movement before you stop out. You've got 250,000 rand in your account, 2% of that is 5,000 uh, bucks. So you take 5,000 divided by the risk and you get to 1,000 shares, that's how many shares you can take. Pros and cons to everything in life. Uh, pros are you can easily manage your risk so it keeps you objective, you know where your stop loss levels are, you know that your risk is contained, um, there's lots of room for error, so you can get a whole bunch of trades wrong, 2% hits on capital isn't really that bad, um, and it keeps you objective so that you, you know, pull your stops when it comes to it. The cons are that sometimes your gearing gets massive. So now you've got 20 trades open, they've all got the 2% rule, um, or you've got three trades open and your stops are so tight that your account is geared five, six, seven times, and you don't realize how much risk you're actually taking on. I mean, it's happened to me a couple of times. You've got 10 or 12 trades open, market moves 3%, and you get wiped out of all of them, all 2%. And that hurts, you know. So you don't necessarily uh, understand the amount of risk you're taking because you think everything is contained by 2%, but you've got 12 or 20 trades open, you know. So then there's the exposure rule. So just to, uh, just to clarify how... I think of exposure. So if I take 20% exposure in a stock, let's say I've got 100,000 Rand in my account. If I take 20% exposure, I'm buying 20,000 Rand's worth of stock, which means I'm geared 0.2 times, because if I'm geared once, then I've got 100,000 Rand's worth of stock. If I'm geared 0.2, I've got 20,000 Rand's worth of stock, which means I'm using 2% of the margin in my account, which is ultra conservative, because 
With a 2% rule, you might risk 2% of your capital, but you could use 10% you know, of the margin, which means you're geared once on that trade. Right? So this is a bit more of a conservative way of doing it. Um, so the basic rule says that each trade is a set percentage of exposure versus capital, either 20%, 25%, 10%, 15 12 and a half, whatever your number is. Um, again, Bionic Turtle is going to help you build spreadsheets that allow you to, back, to build drawdown models and that kind of stuff in case the market falls. So one of the rules is that you can have a maximum gearing of one per trade. So I can buy 20 grand worth of Sassel today, I can buy 20 grand worth of Sassel tomorrow, 20 grand, 20 grand, 20 grand, until I've got five positions, um, or if I'm buying 25% uh, increments, I can have four positions until I'm geared once in that stock maximum. Okay, so I can't gear myself more than once on any individual stock. And I can have a maximum of five positions open, which means that I can have a maximum of five times gearing. Okay, so how it works is when the market falls, you gear up. So if the market is trading within 5% of its all-time high, your gearing is one. So if you've got 100 grand, that's how much stock you can buy. If the market falls between 5% and 10%, you can gear twice. Now you can buy 200 grand worth of stock. The deeper it falls, the more you gear up. So between 10 and 20, three times. 20 and 35, four times. 35 and 55 times. Last time the market fell 50%, it's 1929 and briefly in 2008. So, I mean, it doesn't happen very often. Um, so this allows you to take on more risk as the market falls, as the probability of the market recovering increases. Okay. Uh, of course, you still have to take high probability setups. Um, one to two risk reward ratio or better. Uh, and you can add on trend aligned swings. So let's say, for example, you're now mixing that longer term trading strategy that I showed you with a shorter term way of thinking. So you could buy, for example, your first increment of 20% exposure. It runs up, comes down a little bit, gives another buy signal, add another 20%, runs up, comes down, add another 20%, and so on. Okay? You can not necessarily, this does sometimes allow you to look at a trade and go, have I got the trade wrong? or is my timing off, right? So you don't necessarily have to stop out at a particular level. So it can be risky. So I'm gonna go straight into the cons. Variable sizes of losses. You can't as easily predetermine exactly how much you're gonna lose when you get it wrong. You're gonna to have to manually calculate it every time. Okay, so sometimes it's gonna be half a percent of capital, sometimes it's gonna be 2%, sometimes it's gonna be 3%, okay? The back testing that I've done on this thing if you get stopped out and you've built into a position uh, over a period of time and the hard stop at the bottom you know, can cost you a 12 and a half, sometimes slightly more if you take slippage and transaction costs into place of capital. And that's a big loss. But remember, you've only got a very, few, a very small number of uh, uh, positions open. So that's almost like the worst case scenario, right? Um, and then uh, deep drawdowns, which is every now and then when one of these trades go wrong, they go wrong in a big way. The pros are, it prevents you from being blindsided by the market by taking multiple 2% trades. So you don't have this, oh, I'm safe, I've got 2% risk, and then 10 trades stop out simultaneously and you're down 20%. Right? So it keeps you mindful of how much exposure you're taking. If you've got 100,000 Rand in your account and you're sitting with 600,000 Rand exposure, I mean, if it goes wrong, it can hurt. You're going to lose more money than you have in your account and you're going to have to probably sell your car and you know, the bank's going to come fetch it. So this keeps in your head the whole time how much risk you're actually taking, how much risk you're exposing yourself to. Because I find that sometimes the 2% rule, you know, discards that completely that, hey, I'm geared four, five, six times, but I'm only risking a small percentage of capital, which is not always true because if there's like a black swan type event, that thing can wipe you out. You know, if you take, for example, uh, the moves we've seen on the U.S. market just in the last couple of days, you know, you're caught on the wrong side of that. There's slippage. That thing rips you 2% beyond your stop loss and, you're, and you get three times on that individual trade. I mean, that's going to hurt. This is not going to hurt so bad. So your, your returns are somewhat lower. Your equity curve is somewhat more stable, but your, your risk isn't as high. Okay, so an example of how the gearing works. So this is the Dow Jones Industrial Average over a, on a weekly time frame. So that was the previous all-time high. This is today. It's probably higher. I don't know. Um, I did this chart this morning. So I've marked here the first 5% down. You can gear once in that zone. So as the market falls, you geared once. 
falls down to 10%, which is the next increment here, so that's the midpoint. You can be geared twice here. And then there's your 20%, you can be geared three times here. So as the market falls deeper and deeper and deeper, you can take on more risk because the probability of it bouncing back is increasing. 50% retracements are rare, um, but the system is built in such a way that you should be able to withstand that. Okay, so keeping discipline, that's the next sort of thing. I think keeping discipline to me is the derivative of managing your emotions. When you're self-aware uh, in the sense that you understand the emotional state that you're in, what got you there, and how that influences your way of thinking, it helps you stay objective and helps you stick to the rules. So you need to stay rational about the facts. Okay? If a situation is not what you thought it was, not working out, or some big fundamental thing has changed, you need to stay rational in the sense that um, you, st you keep in mind that things have changed and you need to get out and you need to act in your own best interest. Um, I put this one in because you know someone once said to me like, "Hey, uh, can I start an investment account with you? But I want you to prevent me from taking the money out." I'm like, no, you need to take accountability for your own future. You need to take accountability for your own money, your own decisions. You can listen to experts, you can follow trade ideas, you can do whatever you like, but the decision is ultimately yours. You cannot pin that on anyone else's, on anyone else. So you need to take accountability. For your consequence, for the consequences of your mistakes, and obviously the rewards of your, of your discipline. Um, writing a strategy helps. So I showed you the example of that strategy. Writing something out like a document out like that helps you really think about how you're building this thing. What are all the different possibilities? What do you need to account for? Writing that out on a piece of paper that you can stick on your desk or stick on your wall or use as a background on your computer, seeing it all the time keeps you mindful of the rules. So. It helps a lot, and going through that process of creating that document also you know, really cements the process in your head. You need to understand that a good trade is not necessarily a winning trade. So I've got a trade open, for example. It's long Sassol, it hit the stop loss. Nah, I didn't take the stop loss, it fell more, I added some. Uh, hit the next level of stop loss, which I now adjusted. Ah, I didn't really take it, it fell more. I added some more, now it's bounced back like it today and yesterday, but it's not a good trade. You know, so it might be in the money on it now, but it's a bad trade because I didn't follow the rules. So a good trade is not necessarily always a profitable one. It is one that you follow the rules in. So you've got to keep that in mind. And then you've got to celebrate the good times or the good trades. You know, a lot of the time we punish ourselves and we lament ourselves and we hate ourselves for the mistakes that we've made. But we don't realize that we've had tons of little good trades in the interim. And we don't celebrate those enough, I don't think. And I think it helps also just go, just sit back every now and say, hey, you know, that's actually a good trade. You know, like... Whether or not it made money or, you know, it was a, a massive day or, a, or a, um, a small day, whatever the case is. If, you know, every one that you write down, I'm not saying throw a house party every time, but, uh, you know, just acknowledge that you've done well. Um, then knowing your stock, right? So one of the main things I think that, uh, that day traders do really well is they understand their stocks like nobody else does. Okay, so... These guys can't tell you, you know, they ask you, what about ADH? You know, the response might be, huh? <laughs> you know, because they know a handful of stocks really, really, really well. So I would suggest if you're starting out or even if you're still in the first couple of years, pick a number of stocks, read their financials, understand their business models, look at the chart in, in history over a long period of time, Look at how the share price reacted to different economic events. A new president came in. What did the share do? Uh, interest rates went up. What did the share do? Uh, consumer confidence fell. How does the market, how does that share react to different external stimulus? Um, and what is the, you know, how does the business make money? Understand their cash flow. Understand their assets. Understand their balance sheet. Um, I think that is a, a very good thing. The best traders I know don't know a hell of a lot about many stocks, but the few stocks that they do trade, they know everything about. So uh, correlation and relative strength is sort of the next thing. This is a bit of a black hole when I started doing this because this could be like a one hour presentation, maybe longer just by itself. Um, so I'm just very briefly going to talk about it. Um, correlation is essentially uh, something that you're going to learn on Bionic Turtle. It's going to show you how to build models to measure correlation in Excel, firstly. Secondly, uh, to understand what it is, Investopedia breaks it all down for you. But correlation is essentially a mutual relationship or a connection between two different things. Okay, so in this case, we're looking at stocks. 
So it's either positive or negative, um, or zero. So it's ranges between one, minus one, and zero is the midpoint. If a correlation between something is perfect, it means that everything that I do, it does, right? So one stock, for example, goes up 1%, another stock goes up 1%. One stock goes down 1%, the other stock goes down 1%. The correlation between those two is 100%, so therefore the correlation is 1. Okay? Then there is inverse correlation. The stock, one stock goes up, the other one goes down. So if one stock goes up 1%, the other one goes down 1%, it's negative 1. If they are independent of each other, the correlation is 0. So to diversify portfolios, essentially, is people pick different asset classes and different shares that are not correlated to each other so that if, for example, the financials in the portfolio start falling, uh, the resources are running because they've got a, a zero correlation or the resources are stable. So this is a way of, of diversifying risk in larger portfolios. Um, but it is also a way to spot opportunities, for example, with pair trading. So you can do something called a relative strength comparison. So if you spot something that is highly correlated, so let's say the correlation between the two stocks is 0.85 or higher or 0.9 or higher, their correlation is fairly high, which means that they move in sync with one another. Okay? If you see this correlation over time, and it seems to be fairly reliable, Bionic Turtle is going to teach you how to measure reliability of correlation as well, and beta and things like that. Um, if you see that that correlation is high, you can use an indicator called a relative strength comparison to see how, those, how that correlation is changing over time. So from time to time, that correlation breaks down a little bit, and the two shares move somewhat independently of each other for a while, but over time, they correct again. Okay, so there's two main sort of ways of doing this. One, you can trade pairs on the, on the idea that the correlation corrects itself. So if the correlation is one, and the shares pull apart, they'll come back together. You can then take that trade. Alternatively, if the correlation between two stocks is minus one, you can trade a pair based on the idea that they're going to continue to have a minus one correlation. So if the two shares are separating, then you would go long the stronger one and short the, the, the weaker one, and you would continue, you'd bet on essentially continuing that correlation or that relationship between them continuing to separate as it is. It's a bit more complicated. I'm not going to cover that. I'm just going to look at normal pair trading, okay? So, disclaimer, this, um, this uh, relative strength sort of method that I'm using here is, uh, was sort of thought up by a guy called Sean Murison at uh, IG. He's their technical analyst, chief technical analyst, I don't know, technical smart guy. <laughs> um, so, what this is doing is this is a chart of Anglos and Billiton uh, back in, starting in 2009. So, What's happened here is this bottom one, the blue and, and the hollow candles, is bulletin, and the uh, red and green candles is, uh, is Anglos. And the charts have been rebased to 100, so they start at the same point. So their prices are different, but you rebase them both to 100, so you can plot them on the same axis. So as you can see in this period, the two trade almost identically with each other, and then they start separating, and they come back together, and they start separating, right? So the correlation at the time for these two stocks, so correlations change, I'm, I just need to say that. So things fundamentally change in correlations, don't always uh, stay close to each other. So you need to every now and then just go and check, is the correlation still one or above 0.85 or whatever the case is. So every now and then this changes. So your relative strength comparative here uh, is basically an indicator that measures the difference between the shares, right? So here the difference is almost zero at this bottom line. So at points like this, they are perfectly in lockstep. Every now and then it moves up to point two, which means that Anglos has pulled above bulletin. You could then short Anglos, long bulletin. And then when they come back together, as you can see, it goes from point two all the way back to zero, you've made money. You might have lost money on the one leg, but you would have made more on the other leg, or you might have made money on both. Right? So you can almost ignore the top part and just trade this bottom part. So you can see it actually ranged quite nicely between 0 and 0.2, back to 0, back to 0.2. So you would go um, long bulletin, short anglers here, and you would go short anglers, long bulletin there, long anglers, and so on, and so on, and so on. Okay? But, as mentioned, that changed. So in 2012, uh, you know, economic conditions changed. Um, anglers had a different CEO. They were 
doing all sorts of things that were making their uh, they were making their business struggle a bit more than the rest of the players. So Billiton started outperforming Anglos. The correlation uh, changed. It was no longer as highly correlated as it was. And you can see it's separated and continued to separate for quite some time. Now that correlation is starting to increase again, but it's not yet at the point where um, I'd say you could safely pair trade it. Important, find your own way. So there are a million different ways of doing this. There are infinite different number of ways of doing this. You have to put the time in to find your own way how to do this. I mean, I wouldn't advise anyone to quit their job and start trading unless they are properly capitalized um, or have uh, enough experience to be able to do it. If you're making more money on an annual basis from your trading account than you are from your job, go for it. Until then, hold off, you know. Um, and it takes time to figure out what works for you. Um, it takes time to, to make the mistakes and learn, okay, this trading style, I'm going to try it, and it works well for a couple of weeks, a couple of months, and then something changes and, you know, it, it stops working. So it takes time to, to, to figure out what is actually suited to your personality. I mean, I remember when I started out, I wanted to be a day trader. And that was the only thing that I wanted to do. And today, I think I'd probably stand a better chance of being a successful day trader than I was when I actually gave it a go but it's not suited to my personality. So the way that I'm trading now is very different to how I envisioned it in the beginning. And it took eight bloody years to figure that out. You know? So it takes a bit of time. So each person is to sort of mess around with different things, try um, different techniques and see what really, what, what sticks and what works for them. And your objectives of why you're doing this is important. What are you expecting from your trading? You gotta keep that in mind. If, you gotta think of it like a business. Think about it, you're putting capital on, you're using a certain, number of tools and analysis in order to create a, a profit. So think of it like a business operation. So your objectives are important and from there you can also then consider how much time uh, and how, many, how much resources can you commit to this. Are you going to take your life savings and put in your trading account? Or are you going to take just 10% or are you going to take just 5%? You're going to put money in that you can afford to lose in the beginning and as time goes by and you become more uh, consistent and more experienced you can maybe up your your uh, total investment into your trading account, but obviously never all of it. Um, so, and also mental resources, you know, how much, how much time have you got to think about this stuff? How much, you know, how demanding is your job? So this is all going to fit into which level of the pyramid am I fitting into in terms of, uh, you know, long term, medium term, day trading. Um, and then just a little bit about myself. Uh, I started my little company. I shouldn't say little. Um, but uh, it's a company that I started recently. It's called Arenia Capital Advisors. Um, people can trade through me through either IG, ProTrader, um, which is Velocity Trade. So you can go to my website, open trading account, uh, offer an elite stockbroking service uh, for those who are interested in that sort of thing. Uh, and then I'm going to be putting some list of some books on my blog tomorrow uh, for you guys to have a look at. And then for a couple of other guys, I've gathered uh, four guys who I think are relatively good, consistent traders. We've all been smashed in October, so please forgive us. <laughs> it's been a tough month. Um, so we basically cover all markets. The rules I gave the guys was uh, any trade idea, as long as it is a trade that you're willing to take uh, or that you actually take with your own money uh, on any market, there's no minimum how many trades you must produce a week uh, or there's no maximum either. So as and when you see ideas, best ideas only and actual trades that you can prove to me that you've taken, uh, they put it up on a site and you can subscribe to that and if you would like you can use the discount code JSE or capitals and you'll get a half price on your first month and that is that